we're, we're losing a generation here and the government seem content to let that happen. And again, I'm not pointing fingers at the government because I think it is a collective, you know, I don't think there is an, a sense of neighborly love anymore. I don't think there's a sense of community. I think there has been a lot of division over time. I think social media certainly hasn't helped. You know, everyone has a voice. So everyone's trying to shout the loudest on social media. Oh, this should be done. Oh, this should be done. Mm. Or maybe you should shut the fuck up and listen. <laughs> That's pretty much my, you know, again, sit down, watch this film, then tell me what you think. Hi, and welcome to the Soho London Independent Film Festival. I'm Liz Farahardy, and I'm really delighted today to be joined by Aaron Truss, who has made an incredibly powerful documentary, The Rob Knox Story. As he walked away, I called the police, and I walked across the road parallel to him, described everything that he was wearing, where he was. And so where are you? Um, I'm outside the metro bar. You need to get a police car down in now. The male with the knife, where is he now? Outside the metro bar now. What's his name? I don't know, I can't him. I mean, this film is a really important story. For anyone that doesn't know about the Rob Knox story, could you maybe just elaborate a little bit on what the, the documentary is about? So the documentary follows my close friend Rob and he had got the part in Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. He uh, got the part of Marcus Belby and unfortunately, um, not long after he wrapped on shooting at Leavesden, he was out celebrating with his friends in Sidcup and he was attacked by a man with two kitchen knives and he was trying to protect his brother who I believe was the target and unfortunately Rob was stabbed five times and uh, he died pretty much you know instantly. So this documentary, it's a long time coming. It sh I am surprised that no one has made this documentary because of the connection with Harry Potter, the fact that it was so big back in 2008. Uh, you couldn't go anywhere without hearing about it. And now it's not been swept under the rug, but I think because it's happened so many times, you know, knife crime and, and, and uh, knife attacks, I think it, it has become sort of diluted in so many ways. Whereas to me, this is the story. This is the knife crime story because I think it really does highlight the fact that it whilst it happened to Rob, it can happen to anyone. It can happen to uh, anyone who has a brother, sister, son, daughter. And I think that's what people are sort of attracted to with this story and why they walk away from it uh, feeling so emotional. Well, I mean, it is so powerful. The way that you have, have done it, the feeling is that, I mean, I felt like I know Rob after watching this. And it's such a beautiful way that you have brought Rob alive and made him a, a real person. You know, it's, it's really human. And then, of course, obviously, when it goes through to what happens, I mean, it's, it's, it's really tragic. And the thing, though, that's so wonderful about it is that you do feel that there is a possibility for change with this. And, you know, I'm just wondering, you know, when you made this, did you want this to, to have a, a further message or did you want it to do something actually even more than that? We were very careful when we were putting the documentary together because a lot of things developed that were beyond our control. There were things that we found out about Rob um, that I didn't even know about when I spoke with Damien Lane, who was the um, detective on the case. Uh, there were things I found out from the old Bailey, which I didn't realise. And in terms of you know, wanting to put my own voice in there and, you know, say, come on, enough is enough. You know, we're, we're 13 years down the line and this is still happening. Um, we were very, we didn't want to answer any questions because we're not the authority on knife crime. We're filmmakers. Uh, we're a grieving family. We are trying to put something together without interference from the media who like to put spins on things, whether or not it's to sell rags or, or whatever. But we felt that we had a, a, a tremendous opportunity, but also we were obliged to tell Rob's story as truthfully. And, and as Ray said to me very early on, he just said, just tell it how it is. 
which is all you need to do. There's no glitz or glam. Uh, the Harry Potter stuff is, you know, is, is the truth. It's we didn't make anything up, and um, and that was really important to us. So we kind of just decided, okay, we're going to tell it how it is, and we're going to let people decide whether or not they feel safe. That was pretty much it, and that's why we ended the documentary with the the figures that come up at the end. And and to be honest, like I said before, you only have to tell the one story, um, and that's all you. Whatever you take away from that fantastic uh if, if it does anything great if it if it sparks a conversation that's a start that that's all this documentary is it's a start it's not trying to solve anything it's not trying to point the finger at anyone even though it would be very easy to do so if we're talking to each other about it like we are now mm -hmm. here in the studio then fantastic because it means there is a dialogue happening because of this film absolutely i mean that is what it's doing you know, because it's, it's putting it out there because it could happen to anybody. So it's really, yeah, I mean, it's very important. I, I have to ask because, oh, so you were Rob's friend. Mm. How was that making this film? You know, when you've got such, you know, the connection to the family, to Rob, yet, you know, you're having to, I mean, it's still a really open wound, yet as the filmmaker, You've got to wear a different hat. How, how did that work for you? Yeah, you really, it's easier said than done, but you do have to separate yourself professionally when you're doing something like this because I probably spent a lot of time on the road. I spent a lot of time talking to people and then I edited everything from home. So Rob's voice was always there. It was constantly there. And especially when it came to the night that Rob died in the, in the narrative, I say in the narrative, it was very real. But then when when you try to look at it objectively, and there were people around me, we brought on creative consultants that helped out and tried to steer things in an objective way. Otherwise, I'm writing a love letter to my friend who I miss very much and still do. But it was incredibly hard. But the thing that really pushed me was the fact that I knew I wasn't alone. I'm a true believer in the fact that teamwork makes it happen and... You know, you've got your audio guy, you've got your second unit director, you have the musicians who are making the soundtrack, Taxi Joe, and you have all these wonderful people around you, especially Colin. Like, Colin and I have been inseparable for the last three years now, and whether it's, you know, late night phone calls, whether it's talking to Jamie about what happened, that was hard, having to... Yeah. Because I didn't know. I knew what people had told me. I'd never heard it from him, what happened. So when we shot his interview in the garage and, you know, it was it was a closed set, if you want to call it that, and it was um, very intimate. And I just said, look, just run me through everything. You know, I'm your camera, run me through everything that happened. Don't hold back. I'm just going to keep running. I'm not going to interrupt. Just tell me what happened. And Jamie did something that he's never done with a filmmaker or, or, or anyone in the in the press, and he opened up, and it was, you know, you'll never get that again. So that was hard to see. And then they, uh, they put him in the ambulance and took him up to Queen Mary's. He relived it for me, he relived it for you, he relived he it for the audience, and I'd never seen him cry before I was crying, and, and once, I'd seen Jamie open up. I thought, well, fuck it. You know, we, we've got this far. I'm not alone. We're all together because of Rob. And if we're going to get through this, then, you know, at least we're not going to do it alone. And Colin was certainly not alone either, even though he's had to deal with this for the last 13 years. There's finally a team around him that are saying, what is the story you want to tell? And that's always how we've done it from the get-go. Colin, what do you want to do? How do you feel about us doing this? You know, And we were able to accomplish what he had in mind and how he wanted to see his son on the big screen or, 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 or to audiences. I mean, that's got to be a testimony to your friendship. Because <laughs> yeah. I, I know you weren't the first person to make something with this, were you? And it... It, no, no. It, it, the, I'm trying to remember when the project first started. I think it was about 2013, and I was interviewed for it. And 
I didn't. I, I, I think I'd had my interview and I didn't hear anything back. And I thought I'll, I'll, I won't bug them. You know, it's not the kind of thing you do. It's you know, I, I don't care as long as it's a good documentary. Years go by, and I think it was about 2017, 2018. I, I just sort of asked Colin in passing, "How's it going?" And he said, uh. "I thought, what do you mean? This is a documentary about your son." He went, "Oh, they they filmed something, but I." I don't think it's going to go anywhere. And I said, well, let me take a look because I, I want to see this documentary come out. And I think around about that time, there was a lot of knife crime in the news. And I thought, well, where's that documentary? And um, I had a look at this piece that was put together. It was about 45 minutes long and it was crap. And I voiced my concern to Colin. I said, it doesn't flow well. You know, who the hell am I to criticize someone else's work and what they were trying to accomplish? And then I just said to Colin, Give me the rushes, give me everything you have. I'm an editor, I've worked you know, doing X, Y, and Z. Let me try. And I think I sent him a, a three minute, five minute preview of something that I would do. And he said, I want you on it. And I thought, yeah, it's okay, it's a feature length thing, let's do it. And then the, the ball started rolling and it was on the phone to Warner Brothers, it was on the phone to whoever would give me the time of day. And uh, and I think Ray Winston was one of the first people who came on board. Um, really? Yeah, I, I remember yeah. it clearly because I've I've kept in touch with him all these years since Cold Kiss, and I remember getting on a train from London Bridge, and uh, I, I think I left him a voicemail, and he called me back on the train, and um, he said, "Oh, what do you want, boy?" <laughs> <laughs> she was like, "All right, okay, um, not gonna not gonna mess him around." And he, I just said, "Look, we're gonna do this documentary. It's about this." And he immediately said, when do you need me? I didn't even have to ask him. He was already there. And I think within a matter of a few weeks, we were down to Essex at his lovely home, filming with him and talking about, you know, knife crime, but also Rob's story. And it was incredibly electric. Just the raw emotion that was coming out of Ray. And immediately we knew we had a spokesperson for the documentary. It's all good me saying, you know, knife crime is wrong. But when Ray Winston, you know, says something is wrong with things, the government aren't pulling their weight, it's this, that, you know that you can sort of get behind Ray and say, OK, he's going to lead the charge for us. And then David Yates comes on board. So now we're going down to Warner Brothers and, you know, I'm thinking, oh, my God, what's going to happen next? Jim Broadbent comes on board because David Yates says, you need to do this documentary. So then he, you know, and it just sort of snowballed. And, you know, it wasn't just the the star side of it as well. I was able to get access to Rob's family and uh, to cousins and to, to the detective involved. And and this was stuff that wasn't included in the original rendition. So I was, I was blown away at how quickly everyone came together um, to, to, to do this. It was, it probably would have got it done sooner if COVID hadn't have happened. But to be honest, by the time COVID hit, we were already in post-production and you know we were kind of lucky with that so it was just you know staying at home making sure it got done and sending it you know having zoom meetings with everyone how's this look and trimming it down i think the original version was about almost two hours long <laughs> but we we brought on nick kenton who had worked in true crime on tv worked he's done a lot of stuff he's been in the industry for such a long time and he really whipped my ass into shape to get it down to a you know, suitable, you know, I think it was like 50 minutes. I think he wanted to get down to 45, but we felt at that time we told the story in the, the correct amount of time. So, you know, a lot of sleepless nights. But to go back to your question, how did I do this when I was so close to Rob? Well, I didn't do it alone. If I did it on my own, I'd probably be a hot mess because Rob was a friend, but I made new friends on the way telling Rob's story. So that's how we did it. Yep. And the heart that's in the story. It's all raw or as raw as it can be with editing. You know, we, we try to linger on certain things and and especially Colin, Jamie, Sally. And um, if it's true and it's honest, then people will, will accept it. They're not going to think it's forged or fake in any way. Yeah. I mean, like film is such a powerful tool, isn't it, for telling these stories? It's a very, very important way of doing it. And what are you hoping to achieve with the film? What's the goal with the film now? I want as many people to see it as possible. I realise with knife crime, people aren't really people don't understand trauma of a certain nature unless they've experienced it. And 
you know, a, a lot of people go through a, a lot of hardship, and, a, and especially in times like these. And I really, really try my best to put myself in someone else's shoes when they tell me something you know, terrible that happened to them. And and even so, I still can't imagine going through that. But then a lot of people come up to me and say, oh, it must have been so hard for you with Rob after what happened. And I think it's hard to sort of, you know, I can't Vulcan mind meld with them, but it's it's hard that I can't just get across my feelings. And I thought the film for me uh, didn't give me any closure, but it, it did allow me to tell the story in a way that I wouldn't have to open my mouth and try to convey the emotions I felt because I think the emotions are all there. And anything that's in that documentary is pretty much how I felt um, personally. You know, it's, you say about film uh, covering social issues and, and Ray doing you know, things like Scum and Nil by Mouth. And for me, one of the films that I very much relate to in this time with knife crime and doing the documentary was um, Network. We sit watching our TVs while some local newscaster tells us that today we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. We know things are bad, worse than bad. They're crazy. It's like everything everywhere is going crazy, so we don't go out anymore. We sit in the house, and slowly the world we're living in is getting smaller, and all we say is, please, at least leave us alone in our living rooms. Let me have my toaster and my TV and my steel-belted radios, and I won't say anything. Just leave us alone. Well, I'm not going to leave you alone. Peter Finch uh, has this scene in the film where he's lost his mind a little bit, but he's on live TV and he's he's saying he's sick of the state of everything and he's urging people to go to their windows and say, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And that's how I felt. And I felt, why isn't anything being done? Why aren't we going out there and saying, you know, actually, we're completely fucking sick of this. Why can't we have any change? It kind of feels to me, without going too much into it, because that's another conversation, that there is not enough being done, not just with knife crime, but on a lot of social issues, a lot of mental health issues. And because everyone's firing at each other, we're not really having the right conversation. When We're kind of shouting at each other, where it's via social media, whether it's about, I'm getting jabbed, I'm not getting jabbed, or, or, or whatever, or they should lock them up, harsher sentences. Everyone's got their own view but we're not talking about it. And meanwhile, our lords and masters, the government, are kind of just sort of sitting back and going, well, at least they're not pointing the finger at us kind of thing. Or maybe they are, but they're kind of just watching the fight ensue. And and with this film, I kind of just want people to sit down for 50 minutes, watch Rob's story, and whatever you take away, at least it's an honest feeling. You know, whatever, however your reaction is, at least it's honest. I haven't influenced it, hopefully. That's not the point of it. I'm not trying to point any fingers. But as long as we're having honest conversations, honest reactions, maybe we can talk to each other. That's what I want. That's And if it saves one life, as Colin says, we've done our job. Yep, absolutely. And something positive that has come from this, of course, is the foundation, the Rob Knox Foundation, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, I mean... Could you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of weird thinking about it because they do a lot involving young people in film. And when Rob and I were growing up and making our silly zombie movies and whatever it was, I kind of wish we had some sort of backing, even though we were, you know, new to it. You know, we were given a couple of DV cams, PD-150s or whatever, and we shot this thing in a Sainsbury's on a night shift, and it would have been nice to have some direction, being taught how to write a script, little little things, you yeah. know, uh, storyboarding. And it was only after Rob's, you know, death that the foundation was set up. They had a lot of money coming in because they wanted to prevent knife crime, raise awareness, and then they started opening up little things like their film academy. Uh, the film festival, which is run by Michael Waring, and this was to get kids off the streets, put a camera in their hand, put pen to paper. What story do you want to tell? We'll go out, we'll film it, we'll show you how to edit it, and then we'll show it on the big screen at Cineworld Bexley Heath, and that's incredible. And uh, you know, it's a, it's an original way of looking at it. And, and Jim Broadbent actually said it's a it's a very creative way of looking at the situation 
uh, and, I, and I've spoken to a lot of charities that work with younger kids, um, like Lives Not Knives, and you know, getting them into you know workplaces, jobs, educating them. But for the Rob Knox Foundation to take what you know Rob's aspirations and pass that on to kids who are less fortunate who who aren't going to get given the opportunities unless the Rob Knox Foundation is there to help them out. That's incredible. It really is. And it's such, I mean, it's such a beautiful thing to actually go, we're really hurting. This is really awful what's happened. Mm. Okay, how can we help mm. so some other people don't go down this path? I, I, it's, yeah, it's, it's really it powerful. Was, it was great seeing you there as well at the, oh, uh, the film festival. Oh, thank you for festival. having me. So, um, <laughs> and, and you've seen firsthand um, just what, you know, the, they show all the films, everyone networks with each other, some industry people there, and then right at the very end they're given awards and they come up and they're so shocked, like they're given mm. this trophy and a certificate and and not only that, they've seen their film on the big screen, which is Incredible. how I just blows my mind <laughs> how, you know, for one night only you can see your film that you made with your mates or or whoever and, and it's not just them as well. There are, you know, films from all over the world which is fantastic people know about rob all these yeah. years later because he's his name represents a, a fantastic festival that's made with love dedication and and they, they they're going to keep it going for as long as well i'm around i'm pretty sure they're going to ask me to take over once <laughs> um, once michael wants to stop doing it but regardless it's a fantastic thing and probably one of the best things to come out of uh, Rob's passing you know it kind of feels like he's still there because that's what he was about yeah it's yeah it's really really powerful I mean he would be so so proud wouldn't he oh he would have loved to have been a part of something like that yeah. I know I would have and I know I'm I know I am but you know aside it would have been nice to sort of you know make a film with Rob and yeah. and to do that but unfortunately um, not long after we filmed the zombie movie um, he was murdered, so he didn't even get to see that film we made. It was so quick, and um, yeah, that's that's one of the regrets I have is the fact that we had so much fun. And, um, you kind of take for granted that people are going to be around forever, but unfortunately, that's not the case. And that's another another thing that we try and highlight in this documentary is not to take things for granted, especially other people. Yep, and that really does come across as well. It's like I said at the beginning, for something that's so tragic, you, you watch it and it's so heartbreaking. It is also left with a feeling of just there is a possibility for things to change. Things can be better, and that we've got to step forward because our governments aren't, are they? No, no, no. That's you know? it, Ray, Ray hit the nail on the head, and he always does when you speak to him about it. It's like they're doing fuck all, <laughs> and it, it's it's true. It's not you know a case of you know left or right or whatever, red or blue. It's it's a case of the fact that, that that not enough effort has been put into it, not enough finance. You see a lot of uh, charities and youth centres being shut down. Um, so where are these kids going to turn to? You, you said that in the interview. I'm paraphrasing you. Sorry, but it's true. No, no, it's, no. It, but but it is, isn't it? Because it's like you you look at you know prevention. Yeah. That that is the thing because you know if kids are, are completely disenfranchised and they're not having any kind of positive. Um, yeah. influences and they've got nowhere to go they've got no role models they, yeah. they've they got nothing to really look up to and we're, we're losing a generation here and the government seem content to let that happen there are people and there are charities out there that are really trying if there could be you know charities that are connecting more with each other I would love to work more with Lives Not Knives I think they're incredible MIDI Music as well they're absolutely incredible they're run by Wazzy Brewster who puts a heart and soul into the arts as well for younger people. Right. But more music, but she absolutely understands the situation that's happening in London and that situation is being replicated all over Britain. So, um, but yeah, we all need to come together, whether it's charities, whether it's people, and we need to get that community spirit back. I totally think we should be sitting down and loving thy neighbour, you know? It's simple. Get off your phone, go see someone, go check on someone, you know, meet new people in the flesh, you know? And I think once we have a community, I think then we can take the next step and figure out what, how to best to understand the next generation because they're going to be different to what's come in the past, you know? Yeah. 
Absolutely. Oh, Aaron, it's just been such a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you for having me. And, it, you know, thank you that you, you've got so much passion for all of this and you're actually doing something about it. And that's really inspiring. It really is. Yeah, again, I don't know why this hasn't happened before, this documentary. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be the one who got to tell the story. You well, know. thank you. Thank no you worries. so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you for watching and make sure that you watch the Rob Knox story. It's screening as part of the Soho London Independent Film Festival and you have to see it, you really do. This is a very, very important film and it's a beautiful film as well. Thank you.